if eternity is not involved, it doesn't interest me. Yeah. So, you know, the poor, young, leading people to Christ, uh, helping people become uh, self-sufficient. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who was actually in the arena, whose face is marked by dust and sweat and blood. Welcome to the Men in the Arena podcast, where we interview specialists in the realm of manhood. Each of our guests is an expert in their chosen field or cause as it relates to men. Our conviction is to call you into the arena of manhood, call you out of the faceless, nameless bleachers, and call you up to be the best version of you. Because when a man gets it, everyone wins. Enjoy today's episode. Men in the Arena Army. We, we salute, salute you. you. Hey, guys, thanks for listening to another episode of the Men in the Arena podcast. I'm Jim Ramos, and I am here with Dale Culver. How are you doing today, Hawaii Five O? with hey, your Hawaiian hey, shirt? Hey, how you doing? Is there a cord that plugs that in to light it up, or no. does it just come that bright? Are you jealous? I'm a little jealous. Kind of yeah. Alo- Aloha. Yeah, it's Friday, so... Aloha yeah. Friday. It is. Aloha Friday. Yes. Casual Friday. No, yep. I actually like this shirt. I have. I'm not gonna lie, I really do. As soon like as the shirt. school year's over, I get another trip to Hawaii, so I'm pretty pumped. Taking the uh, youngest kid. Oh, that's right. She the wants to trip. go to where the set of Hawaii Five O was filmed. Oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> well, have fun. Well, hey, I want to encourage the guys listening right now to head on over to our website, menarena.org. Make sure they take the forty statement assessment mm-hmm. that'll evaluate where they rank and stand in their manhood. And then sign up for one of our groups. We have one more week to sign up for these groups, and we're shutting them down until the winter cycle. We have a couple spots left for the Pacific Standard Time teams, and I think we have a little bit of room left for our Eastern Standard Time team. And then I also want to encourage you guys, in in about two weeks, maybe a week from when you hear this podcast, I am releasing a free online resource called Tell Them What Great Fathers Tell Their Sons and Daughters. This is an amazing book. It's short and sweet. It's 200 statements that great dads need to tell their kids. It's really, really a cool thing. It comes with reflection questions. I mean, it's really, really well put together. I'm very, very proud of this book. And it's something we want to offer men as a free resource. Though you guys in the stress bubble of life who are trying to raise your kids, we are handing you a resource on a platter that will really be a game changer. So make sure uh, you do that. And I know that we mentioned this a little bit when we interviewed Rex Tigner last week. And so uh, make yeah. sure you guys head on over there. So I got to tell you guys, I'm, I'm excited about today's guest. Half a dozen times a year, we strategically interview guys that we call our average Joe arena heroes. These guys uh, are like you and me. They're in the arena fighting for those people that and causes they love. Uh, our experts and authors are our bread and butter. But it's so cool to get guys who are actually just going for it in life and to bring them on the show and share an area that they are passionate about and very, very strong in this area. And so this guy I'm excited about because he's one of my best buddies. He's one of five guys I pray for daily. Yes, Dale, you are one of the five, too. And Thank we, you. Both, we both need it. And we both need oh, it. Yeah. And I know he's, Rick, you've been praying for me and my family I, for how I, many years? I did this morning, my friend. This morning? I didn't pray for you this morning. That's all right. Dude. Day's not over. <laughs> I know. I'll pray for you today. <laughs> Somebody so, was praying because yeah, I got so, out of bed and I'm okay, breathing. So. Yeah. But you didn't see any elk on the way over, so nope. they weren't praying hard enough. You're funny. <laughs> anyway, so he's a, a dear friend of mine. Uh, I just finished a book called The Full Capacity Man. It's going to be released in June. But there's a chapter on generosity, and I focused on uh, this friend of mine, Rick, and another friend of mine and their stories because they're two of the most generous guys I know. And I don't know about you guys, but I think generosity is difficult for guys, especially guys who are living yep. in the stress bubble. Their resources are often limited, and they – they view their stewardship as something they can do or should do, but not something they must do. And I think there's a paradigm shift that needs to happen biblically. And so, uh, Rick, I think you model this beautifully. But before I bring you on, I want to ask you, Dale, if you have a man word for me today. And listen, if it's generous or giving, you're fired. Ah, see, you know, naturally what comes to mind is Did you get your vanilla generous. latte this morning to no, go with I your got, vanilla words? I got Americano right here, Okay, baby. well then maybe you might, maybe you're going to give me a word that's going to actually, like, not be vanilla. All right, so uh, my word is full throttle. Ha! That's not a word, I dude. Know. I know. You don't... can't use a, you can't use, it's a man word, not a man phrase. You can fire me again. That's Gosh, fine. I swear. Like, last week you fired you me, know, so I, I can do whatever I want. You know, I know you did, you just put a hyphen in there. 
No, I didn't even, okay, I didn't go even bother hyphening it. You get, you can do it, but you <laughs> cannot talk about our guest in talking about that phrase. <laughs> so go ahead. <laughs> well, full throttle is says this in the dictionary. Uh, it's in the dictionary? It actually is one the, word? Well, the phrase. Yeah, I, exactly. I found it in Wikipedia, baby. <laughs> Whatever. If you say that something is done full throttle, you mean it is done with great speed and enthusiasm. It's not just great speed, but there's enthusiasm behind it. This second phrase that was in there says this, he lived his life at full throttle. And I'm thinking, that would be pretty cool to have on your gravestone. Yeah. He lived his life at full throttle. Oh, and so it's okay. like, whatever you're doing, man, just get into it. Get her done. We're launching a, a men's ministry at our church. Nobody was doing it. And I just rallied a bunch of guys around. And I'm looking back now. I'm like, dude, we have a barbecue coming up tonight. And I've done nothing. Yeah. And well, so and it's I pretty think, awesome when I, you get guys yeah. fired up. I, I love the phrase full capacity. Yeah, that's, I, I don't know. Book about that's that. kind of lame. But, but I think uh, full throttle but, is but, better. But my friend Rick over here, that's the phrase yeah, that he if, loves to use. If you were labeled use. half throttle, that would be kind of a bummer, wouldn't it? Yeah, they have a pill for that. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I'm so, not sure about that. But. It's blue. <laughs> so, hey, Dale, is, do you have a hero story for us today? Anybody out there doing some great things for God? Yeah. A uh, friend of ours, Joe in Colorado, sent it, this in that um, he received six copies of the Strong Men Dangerous Times, and he's an LEO, law enforcement officer. And he's got some guys that uh, he's going to be giving this to. He's pretty pumped about it. And he just wanted you to know how much he appreciates you pouring yourself into this book and that um, you are you were on his mind, and he wanted to let you know that. So. Yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, we, uh, we, for a limited time, we were offering free copies of Strong Men Dangerous Times to law enforcement officers, first responders, and that type of uh, individual. So uh, we got to send out hundreds of those books. And so pretty cool. So appreciate that. And that's uh, making a difference. And he's out in Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. So that's cool. That's cool. So, hey, I want to talk about my friend uh, Rick Robinson is here today. Normally we interview virtually, but Rick is sitting in my office, sitting across from me. Rick splits his time uh, between Oregon uh, in Lincoln City, Oregon, and Lanai City, Lanai, which is in the Hawaiian Islands. He's married to his beautiful wife, Roxanne, for 43 years, and he is semi-retired. He's the founder and CEO of Robinson Nursery Incorporated. Rick, good to have you back, man. Wow, man. I, that was a buildup right there. I like you, that. Yeah, well, uh, the reason why I said glad to have you back is we interviewed you in 2017, and we lost your interview. Sorry. And it is uh, it is one of the coolest interviews we've ever done dealing with generosity and i think that's a big struggle for guys especially during this season economically and with the the stuff with covid and i i just think that you have such a great perspective of giving i wanted to bring you on the show fire away so but before i fire away i want you to just take a few minutes and tell these guys a little bit about your story your life what makes you tick things you enjoy just anything that these guys would need to know well that's a good question Grew up in Michigan, met my lovely bride when I was 16. She was 15. Couldn't go out with her to, for another year because her parents were hung up on the 16 thing. I did not know that. And we have dated ever since. Married, have had uh, four kids, two girls, two boys. Uh, two boys are buying the business from us, which we're excited about that. The two girls both have really good jobs, and we have 10 grandkids, and Life is, uh, as Dale said earlier, pretty full throttle. <laughs> is she your only girlfriend that you ever had? Uh, pretty much. Dale, that's kind of like you and Heather, right? She's your first, like... When well, you know, you know, bro. Wow, that's pretty cool. Well, so you've, been you with know, Heather, you've been with Heather since she was, what, 11, 12? <laughs> I sang at her 13th birthday party with our heavy metal band. So oh, you, you were, did? So started 13, dating 15, right after that. Let, let's not do that, okay? Wow, that's cool, Rick. I, I mean, I well, you know, let's see. We can start with the pastor jokes for better or worse. You know, I couldn't have done better. She couldn't have done worse. <laughs> well, I, I, she posts pictures all the time on social media, and she posts this one picture of you and her when you were first married, and it just cracks me up because you were like, you couldn't have been more than twenty. I think I was a little less than that, yeah. And you were, but I actually had long hair, long blonde hair, skinny yeah. little guy. I mean, you're not skinny, but you're you're in good shape. Yeah. But uh, oh man, I love it. Well, it's great to have you on the show, man, and and I, I, it's always fun to hang out with you. Well, and, I appreciate and, you uh, both. So, so yeah, no, it's been fun. So so tell us, I'm gonna I want to go back uh, to the earlier days of your starting Robinson Nursery. What what prompted you to start this business? Because you were in the nursery business, but you were doing something else. 
Why did you decide to start a business on your own? Well, you know, when I was about 12, I started working part-time in a nursery. And I just always knew, for some reason or another, that one day I would have my own. And um, one thing led to another, and I went to Michigan State for nursery management, uh, took a job in Minneapolis at a large nursery, and then they moved me out to Oregon to work at their West Coast uh, farm. And then uh, one year I just started planting a few on the side. I think maybe we planted 10,000 trees the first year and a few more the next year and the next year. And my wife and I, after work, we'd go out there and work till dark. And, uh, you know, it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I don't know why, but it turned out to be a pretty successful venture. Now, now your niche was bare roots, right? Yeah, we started out as a bare root nursery. I mean, we shake the dirt off the plants, put them in coolers and ship them in the spring in refrigerated trucks. And uh, now we've kind of morphed uh, into about maybe, maybe 60% of it is in containers. And uh, mainly did that so we could get sales throughout the season instead of just in the spring. Wow. And then you're not doing bare root anymore. You're doing we, bare we root are plus, about, plus. About, about 40% of the nursery's bare root, 60% is containers. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, I don't know if you feel comfortable sharing this, but you you literally went full throttle in launching this business. You took a lot of great risks. Do you want to share some of those risks that you took when you launched this business and went full throttle and full in on this? Well, it, it, it's, as far as risks go, I mean, I just liked working 90 hours a week, so that wasn't risky. And, uh, you know, I think we borrowed a little money to buy the first seedlings. And uh, I think my wife was always on board. She kind of was a believer in me for some reason or the other. And um, it just just worked out. I mean, I think I think the risk came uh, at one point. Uh, the the business was fairly good size. Maybe we were selling a couple hundred thousand trees a year, and I was still working a full time job as a production manager for a large nursery. And they came to me and said, "Hey, we'd uh, we'd like to get to either keep working here, or just to, to you know to quit or fire, or whatever word you want to use." They said we'd prefer that you would sell your business and continue to work for us because we like what you're doing. You know, you're good for us. Mm -hmm. And I just said to the guy, I said, hey, I paid more taxes last year than you guys paid me. So, you know, we've been praying and wondering when the time was to cut the cord, and you just made it pretty obvious that it's now. So they gave me three weeks, and I said, I'm out of here. How yeah. old were you? I would have been 38. And when they cut the cord and you started Robinson Nursery full, full on your own, how long before it started to really explode? Oh, it, it was already exploding. I mean, we were, I think we were selling a couple hundred thousand trees at the point, you know, now we're, now maybe we're selling 750,000, but no, God. it was, it was going really well. So, you know, it was the old, maybe I was a little, maybe I didn't, wasn't a full believer yet in it, but, uh, but I became one quickly. So let's talk about full believer. You said full believer in it. At what point in the business did your faith collide with the business? Where were you spiritually as the business was growing? Were you a, were you a Christian man? Where were you? Yeah, we, you know, to go way, way back, I mean, grew up Catholic. Of course, I was sprinkled at some point, whether I, <laughs> <laughs> whether I was all in or just wet, you know, you know, you, you don't know, but it, but at some point, actually I was at a, a business conference one time and they had a Sunday morning church service and I went to it and it's the first time in my life I've heard an altar call. I think I was maybe 21 or 22. Mm. And I was in a hockey arena and in front of us was a little pipe rail and I was holding on to that thing. And I was not going to go down there, not going to go down there. And finally I just melted, man. I went down and accepted Jesus. And that was a foreign thing to me. I just thought, Hey, I'm going to church. Everything's cool. I'm, you know, I'm all right. So that was, that was pretty cool. So you gave your life to Christ. You're like 21 years old. Your business is taken off. You're about 35, you yep. said. Was there a point of convergence, Rick, when you realized that your faith and your business had to interact with each other in some way and have a relationship together? Oh, certainly. But you know, I think before that, I can I can remember one. Uh, you know, I guess big moment was I was we were building a little house in Yam Hill. It was like 900 feet. We had three kids. I remember standing on the outside steps struggling with this whole tithing thing. Mm. And it was kind of like, well, there was a Susan, a Susan Ashton song at the time. I think it goes like, is it going to be hide or seek? 
Oh, yeah, I remember that song. And I think that's what God said to me, Rick, are you in or are you out? And I remember being pretty emotional about it. And it was at that point there that I said, you know what, I'm, if I'm going to go in, i got to start tithing. And so I think that was the first step. And at the time, it was a stretch. I mean, we were having little ones. And be, before kids, I mean, my wife was a nurse. And what? so we, I did not know that. So, so you know, you got, you got the nurse income, and you got the nurseryman income, and don't admit it, but perhaps the nurse was making a little more than the nurseryman was. And so, you know, things were a little tight, but, uh, but we started on faith, and it, you know, it just worked out. I think so, God blessed that. So would you say that you started tithing because God spoke to you in front of your house that day or because the Bible says to? Well, I think it was, uh, I think, in the first place because the Bible said so. And I think I was struggling with what the Bible was saying, and I just needed a little extra nudge. So so the word tithe means 10%, a tenth. At, 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 at that point so, in, my, in my history, it did, yes. So, So a tithe to you meant not giving something. It meant a tenth of your income. That is correct. Is that a net income or gross? What did you... Uh, that was a net at that point. Okay, okay. So you started giving, and how long after that did you take this trip to Israel that you told me about? You know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm guessing I would say it's probably 10 years, maybe eight years after that. I might be off by a year or two. And, uh, you know, you told the story in your book. I mean, I can tell it again if you'd like. Yeah, because but, it, these guys don't have the book yet. It's not. Yeah, right. So, so yeah. this, 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 so eight years after you started tithing, you're now in your mi- early to mid 40s. The business is exploding. You have a lot of income coming in. You're already tithing off that income. But you had something happen that in my opinion, in my, when you told me, it, it just it's mind boggling, guys. It's in the book, Full Capacity Man. When you read the generosity chapter, uh, I don't mention uh, my friend Rick's name, but it's obvious now that it is Rick. But tell us what happened in that story, because to me that is just mind blowing how God worked in and now through you. Sure. Well, you know, I I can literally count on one hand the amount of times that I feel like God verbally spoke to me. Yeah. So at that time in my life, my daughter was uh, oldest daughter Jenny was fourteen. She had the purple dyed hair, <laughs> kind of wondering where she was going to go. And yeah. So I thought, well, my wife had been to Israel, and I thought, well, okay, I'll take my daughter to Israel. Maybe this will be a bonding experience, which it ended up being. I got to baptize her in the Jordan. Oh, that, really? That's pretty cool. I don't even know if she remembers that, but I do. So um, we had been. I mean, God had been nudging me to do go beyond the tithe to given. We were involved in another uh, a number of things given, and uh, you know, at at de- decent rates, I guess you would say. But as God led us, and so we were at, I believe it was a sheep gate, and uh, I'm sitting there, and the so in the gates in Jerusalem, there's a big big door that opens, where, like a truck could go through, and then there's a man door next to it, kind of just like your garage is. And so as I was standing there the the man door was open and i saw uh i think it was a donkey it could have been a horse and a guy was leading it and it had a bunch of pots and pans and stuff on it so he got to the door he had to take a bunch of stuff off the the animal pull the animal through and then he brought the stuff out and put it back on the animal and they took off and god just verbally spoke to me like he was right there it's like rick if you'll unload your program in this life i'll load it back up when you get to heaven and so, you know, it's kind of the, you know, you can use the, the eye, the needle and the camel story from the rich young ruler. But, uh, but, you know, God says, even before he talks about the eye of the needle that, uh, you know, when the rich young ruler said, I've done everything. And, and Jesus says, well, the one thing you haven't done is you haven't given to the poor. Mm-hmm. And he says, if you do that, you know, there's going to be riches in heaven for you. And that was just kind of a culmination of that story in my mind. It was like, whoa, dude, you're kind of telling me that I need to keep on this path and it was pretty mind-blowing at the time so we just continued to follow as god led and god blessed us with income um when we picked i won't say what it was but we picked a certain percentage of income that we were going to give beyond the tithe and we just started doing it and uh and god has blessed us for it and uh not sure why, but we're enjoying it, and uh, and it gives us great satisfaction. I mean, there's so many stories of stuff that our money has done. I mean, obviously, it's, 
I actually, I'm going to say what God's money has done because he does own it all. But just uh, the rewards you get to see things happen uh, through the the stewardship of your resources, it's it's good stuff. Wow. So when, when you read the story of the rich young ruler and the eye of the needle, obviously you weren't at the... There's a mysterious gate in Jerusalem called the eye of the needle, but nobody knows for sure if that actually is a gate that existed. But you're at the sheep gate, and you're at the sheep, the human gate near the sheep gate is there besides unloading the the donkey was there any other significance you saw in that man's actions that you took with you yeah nothing 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 that stands out right now other than you know god was kind of i just felt like god is leading me on this journey and uh, you know the 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 story goes on to say the disciples say to jesus well obviously a camel can't get through the eye of a needle how is it possible for a rich man to yeah. go to heaven and of course jesus responds and says well with god anything is possible yeah so i just you know i just felt like with god moving in my life even as i get resources things are going to work out i'm going to be okay if i use them for god's glory so to speak you know it's really interesting rick so as, as i was writing this book and i did the generosity chapter uh, one of my earlier chapters is actually and you actually were a guy who helped me proofread this book so i would send you the chapters and you would send them back to me do you remember the chapter on hospitality? Sure. So hospitality is really misunderstood among Christians to be like, I have my buddies over for church, uh, that type of thing. But hospitality is from the Greek word philoxenia, which means loving strangers. And when Jesus said to the people, you depart from me, you wicked people, and they asked, well, God, we did all these things in your name, and he, li- he began to list things that they didn't do. Everything that he listed had to do with their neglect of strangers. I see. And now in your giving, it seems to me that a lot of your giving, you're giving to people who you at the time don't know or may never know. Is that true? Uh, large part, that's correct. And so so why... Okay, I want to go back to Roxanne. So I did not realize that you weren't with her in Israel. Uh, nope, we were on separate trips. Okay. We had we had too many youngins to take care of, and we're a long ways from the grandparents. So no, so I, to... yeah, so I understand that. So, so you're going home now. You've heard from God radically, and now you've got to, I mean, quote, break the news to her. <laughs> How did she respond to this this experience you had at the Sheep Gate? I think in a lot of ways it was just a confirmation of what we were already doing. So I don't think it was just like a radical change in what we were doing. It. Uh-huh. We, were, we were doing it at that point. But I think it it just kind of encouraged us to keep on keeping on, going in the direction we were. So I, you and I have been friends for almost 20 years now. And so when I interact with you and generosity, it's usually me interacting with you because I don't go hang out with your wife because obviously guardrails. Sure. Where is Roxanne. I think this is something for our guys to know because because some of the guys that are listening, uh, their wives are the family managers when it comes to finances. Some guys are Christian guys. Maybe their wives aren't on board with the faith yet. Some guys are givers maybe, and they're struggling because their wives don't want to give. You know, a lot of different dynamics here, right? How did your wife, how, how has she come alongside of you? Where Where is Roxanne in the giving process? Is it like you say, hey, we're going to do this? Or or does she say to you at times, I feel led to do this? How do you guys interact together when it comes to your stewardship? Yeah, well, my answer to that is yes. I mean, I have some areas where God rings my bell. She has some areas where God rings her bell. We talk about, um, you know, I'll say, honey, what do you think about this? Let's pray about it. Think about it. Let me know what you think. And she'll go, yeah, full throttle. And in some cases, I mean, she's got a couple of hot buttons, and we support those too. But the but the main things that we support, we're both we're both all in on. And how do you choose? And I, I know that you have a, a I know you have a method here. How do you? I know God leading you to these organizations, and different people groups. But is there are there certain things that you're more passionate about than others? And how do you determine that? Well, I tell a lot of people the best spiritual bang for the buck is not in the United States, it's in the third world. Mm -hmm. Money just, you know, if you want to use a business term, you know, save people for a dollar, you get way more over there than you do here. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, most of the money that goes over there is made here. 
So you know you have to support things in the U.S. or that it's going to dry up. And um, you know, and I think you know God impresses you. And then you know there are things like Charity Navigator where you can go on and I mean, always we look at you know how what's their rating, what percent are they actually going to the front lines, and what's mm-hmm. used up in fundraising and management and the rest of that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, so now is it true still? I had heard this several years ago that nine out of every ten dollars globally that is given to missionaries comes from America. That I don't know. Okay, okay. it, it would. It, it's certainly the majority. Yeah. So that I mean, which is a huge, substantial amount. Now you said I want to use a business term. So let me let me go back and talk to you about that. So I know that you and Roxanne give personally. Does Robinson Nursery give as an organization? Because we have guys listening to this podcast that have their own businesses. And there are voices out there that say, uh, do not, businesses don't give, just give to your personally and let your business be generous with its employees. What's the Robinson Nursery philosophy on giving, or is there one? Well, in our case, we give personally. Um, the way our business is set up is we also own Robinson Farms, which owns all the hard assets, the land, the buildings, the greenhouses. And then we own Robinson Nursery, which actually rents that stuff from Robinson Farms. There's some tax reasons for that. But at one point, uh, all the entities were giving. And uh, since then, due to some tax reasons, we've, we've, we've used, uh, we actually used, uh, went back to personal on everything. So we basically have the business pay us. Myself, my two boys, my two boys have kind of picked up on the giving thing, which is awesome. Yeah, and uh, so the nursery pays us, and we do the giving personally. Okay, so you've had a little bit of shift because of tax reasons. Yeah. Okay, and then we do. I guess I can share. Uh, we do use an outfit called National Christian Foundation. Yes, I know them, and yeah. and we just think it's awesome. And so the money goes into them. We designate where it goes, and it's the kind of thing that can just keep on keeping on. So guys are going. Why? Why the National Christian Foundation? What does that do for you? Well, so without going too deep uh when we set up the transition plan for our boys to buy the business i mean wife my wife and i's dream was to not you know one guy says you want to give your kids enough that they can do anything but don't give them enough that they can do nothing right Mm. so we always thought most of what we have left when we leave this earth and go to heaven we're going to give to charity and so like as we went into the business transition uh, we gifted some to the boys, and we gifted some to National Christian Foundation in which the boys could buy it back. So, you know, they were actually buying it, and we were able to get the uh, some some uh, Christian stuff done also at the same time. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, I think that's a great organization for yeah, guys. Yeah, uh, we're, 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 we're real happy. So one of the things I've seen you transition to in the last 20 years, very adamantly transition to, is your uh, unwillingness to discuss how much you give, percentages you give, and expl- And I think it's, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. I think that Matthew 6 is very clear about why we should do that. But per, for you personally, why is that something that you keep? I mean, I know you're generous because you're my friend, but nobody would know that just on the outside because you don't put that out there. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I, th- I think there's a big danger in money if it's not handled correctly. And I think that, uh, I guess I said it earlier before the show started, I want to have intimacy with God and keeping my giving uh, one-on-one with Him mm-hmm. or my wife and I mm-hmm. and God is just, just a great thing. It just creates a whole lot of things you don't have to go through. Um, and, and, you know, I... I I just feel like uh, it's, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it's a sense of worship. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's interesting. Several times in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talked about people who boast about the things they do for God, and he said something really interesting. They receive their reward in full. And I've often pondered that. Do you know, have you thought about what that might mean? Yeah, I, I like the Lay Up Treasure in Heaven program. Let's do that. I mean, I, I'm I'm not complaining. I'm doing really fine on this earth, but yeah. uh, but let's uh, let's send it on ahead. Well, and what what I hear you saying is, one the moment I put my giving out there to my buddies, that's my reward. My buddies think I'm awesome. Yeah, come back, goes, come back to the pride of life, man. Yep. And yeah, yeah. If you're a man, it motivates about everything we do. Yeah, First John 
two, fifteen to seventeen, the l- love of the world. Uh, what is it? The the, it's the lust the, of the eyes, the lust of flesh, and the pride of life. The Every morning, pride of man, life. I pray God help me crucify them three little rascals. <laughs> <laughs> I call those the big three, man. Yeah. So, so Rick, so you're so so when I hear you talking, everybody has different philosophies about their actual tithing component sure are you what we would call a storehouse tither or you give 10 percent to the local church first and the rest is or do you give as god leads how do you how do you designate the giving theology and i and this is different across the board for people but how do you do it yeah you know it's interesting you bring that up because i think recently my outlook on that has changed i've always been of the opinion that the tithe goes to the local church and the giving goes wherever god leads you mm-hmm. and um we're Let's just say we're reevaluating that at this point. Yeah, and and I, being a pastor for probably twenty five years of my life, I always storehouse tithe. Sure. But then, as I dove into scriptures, I realized the one time where God says, "Test me on the tithe," He's talking to pastors. He's not talking to the layman. And then when I realized, wait, I'm not Jewish. I don't have a storehouse. So for me, I I have a little bit different philosophy. And we give our first ten percent goes to organizations that are kingdom oriented that we love and then we just keep giving right so it's a so but everybody has different philosophies of giving as long as that first 10% does not go to your pocketbook it goes to god well without making a whole lot of pastors really mad at me <laughs> I, I i say you look at the stewardship of what you're given if if yeah. the money if if there's a return on your investment the money is having a happening for the kingdom i say it's good and if it's not then i think you need to think about it mm. yeah and we have a lot of guys on the podcast listening a lot of our guys are not involved in local churches sure and so for them they're like well i don't have a local church what would you say to those guys when it comes to their giving man a lot of people think the local church is a hope of the world and most of the time i agree with that yeah and i do too and we attend a local church i'm actually a, a leader in my local church dale is a leader in his local church and uh, i do give to my local church i just am not a storehouse guy you know what I mean? So I spread the love a little bit, but that's my different philosophy. It's changed over the years, and so I think we all have. I, these... I'm not sure there's there's a right or a wrong answer to that question. But I think the tithing is key. I think, you know, people say, "Well, tithing is an Old Testament principle," and then my response is, "Well, yeah, Jesus said give all of your stuff to Him. So would you rather give Him 100 percent and be a New Testament giver, or would you rather give Him 10 percent and work up from there?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, it's all about where your heart is. Mm. Okay, so let's talk about that. What do you think about this phrase that God doesn't have your heart until he has your pocketbook, your wallet? Do you think there's truth to that? I think there is some truth to that, but I think it's, you know, I think it's part of the journey. You know, as, as, as you go along, you know, there's certain things that you give to God, and sometimes the pocketbook is cl- closer to the end of the journey than closer to the beginning. So what would you say to the guy... You know, the, our our guys that we really target are guys raising families. They're they're twenty eight to fifty five ish. Kids in the home. What would you say to the Christian guy who's listening to this podcast right now, who's saying, "Man, the budget's tight." I mean, I love God, but man, I don't know giving. Oh man, what would you say to that guy who's not quite there with the giving? He's just not tithing yet. Let's just call it tithing. He's not He's not there. How would you encourage that guy to move beyond and to trust God to that next level? Well, I can, you know, I can go back to my experience. When I decided to tithe, you know, we'd been, for lack of a better word, we've been throwing a few bucks in a plate every Sunday, right? And <laughs> yeah. it was, you know, kind of like not real serious, okay? And at the time we did it, it was a sacrifice. And... Um, I guess my advice would be just to get started. I mean, it worked out for us. It was it was tough at first, and then of course you, there is the there is that feeling in your heart, you know, that you're <laughs> you're doing what you need to be doing. Mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. mean, at least in some areas. Totally. Yeah, you know, we got all got everything else we need to work on, but at least you got one box checked off. I hear you. So, so what would you say, Rick? To the there are voices, financial voices out there, and I know that you you're a avid voracious learner and book reader. And so I know you've heard these voices that say this to people, pay yourself first. What would you say to that? What is the lie in that statement? 
Well, I think the lie is that God owns it all. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I mean, he, he made us. He made everything. Yeah. You know, we're just in the process of messing it all up. <laughs> so do you, do, you, uh, do you give out of your first fruits? Absolutely. Okay. I, see, for me, that's what we do as well. How do, is that how you guys do it, Dale? Oh, yeah. Because you guys are very generous as well. Oh, yeah. So for me, I do, I do it personally because I want God to know I'm giving him the tenderloins and not the round steak. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Sure. I want, I want God to know, God, this is a non-negotiable. You're getting it. Boom. Why do you do it? Hey, it's a direct deposit. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it's, 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 it's going before I can even do anything else, right? Well, it crosses over into eternity, right? Yeah, because there, we're there giving it go. to God and we're now trusting him. pastoral on me. Yeah, you're the one that started it, dude, right. not me. So, so Rick, so, so you have a couple phrases that you use with me all the time when it comes to giving. But what are some, what are some key verses for you? Like, what are your favorite stewardship verses? Do you have any that you really hang your hat on? I have a few few uh, quotes that. Yeah, let's do that. High. What are they? It's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jim Elliot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm smarter than I it's look. It's funny man. that I know a guy by the name of Jim Elliot in Hawaii, and when I first heard that, I wrote him an email. I said, "Man, that's a great quote." I didn't know it was some missionary. <laughs> oh, that is so funny. Yeah, he thought he didn't think it was very funny. Well, you know, I think I met him. Yeah, he's a good guy. I feel like I ran into him over there. Yeah. Because I thought the same thing, Jim Elliott. And that's why I figured he's a, you know, he's the kind of guy that would say something like that. But oh, now repeat good. that quote again, because I think it's a great one. It's no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That is so good, man. Are any other quotes that resonate with you? That's probably my favorite. One. How, how about Bible verses? You're putting me on the spot. Well, I'll, I'll give you a Bible <laughs> verse that you quote to me all the time, and I think this is really good because I'm a nonprofit guy, so I'm one of the guys that is going after resources from guys who are givers, guys and gals who are givers. And and you have a, a freeing verse that you quote to me often, and it is simply, you have not because you ask not. Well, that's true. Why is that verse a verse that you like to quote when it comes to giving and people wanting resources? Well, well, you're finding out the biggest challenge that people have is they don't ask. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and then the, 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 the bigger challenge is they're afraid to ask because they've already made up people's mind for them i mean they mm. they they have their answer in their mind already they haven't allowed the person they're asking to make the decision or to let god speak to that yeah, person ab- right absolutely no that's that's super powerful i really appreciate that so what do you think the biggest obstacle is for a guy who's got little kids in the home or teenagers in the home what do you think his obstacle is to giving when you look back on your life or when you talk to your boys What's, what are some obstacles that these guys are experiencing? Well, I would say me, 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 and uh, stuff. So mm. they are their own worst enemy. Well, I don't watch much TV, but watch TV, listen to radio, whatever. You're bombarded. Yeah, yeah. To look over the fence, see what the neighbor's got. You got to have it. If you don't have it, you're frustrated. So what's the lie in that? Well, there's no end to it. There's no, there's no, there's no lasting peace. There's short-term peace, and then pretty soon you want something else, and then that short-term peace is gone. You know, there's it's diminishing returns on that stuff. So you said a couple things there. First of all, there's no end to it. It, it just perpetuates itself. I want, I have, I want more, I want more, I want more. And then you said it's diminishing returns. Can you explain that again? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to spend my time and resources where they're going to last. I mean, you get a new car, it's not a new car very long. Uh, when you store up your riches in heaven, it's you're getting interest, my friend. See, and this is something that you're bringing something up that I think some guys are wrestling in their spirit with. Randy Alcorn calls this the treasure principle. I'm sure you've read his books. Sure. So can you, unlo- can you unlock this again for these guys that are struggling with that? You've got a real strong grasp, Rick, of giving and uh, this treasure principle, I'm not so sure that all of our listeners do. So can you help them to unpack this a little bit more? I'm going to let you share about the treasure principle, and then I'm going to add to it. Well, you know, I read the treasure principle on the way to Hume Lake with a a bunch of kids in a bus, and it's a little teeny book, and basically it's what you've been saying. It's a Jim Elliott quote. 
I want to invest my physical, fiscal resources into kingdom-oriented things so that I can build up my account in heaven. Randy Alcorn also wrote my favorite my favorite work on heaven ever called Heaven. Yeah. <laughs> and he talks about earth is a running head start into heaven. And so what I do on earth matters in heaven. And to quote a, a movie Gladiator, uh, he said, what you do uh, echoes in eternity. What you do on earth echoes in eternity. And I want to create an echo effect. I want to sure. create wealth that goes ahead of me. And that's how I view a treasure principle. And in, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, Paul said something that really impacted me deeply. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to turn it to you. He's talking to the Macedonians. He's, he's telling the Philippians, when I was, you know, you gave me a gift when I was in Macedonia, and I really appreciate the gift. But then he said something that hit me. He said, not that I need the gift, but that I wanted to build your account. And see, this is the thing that I think you understand really well. I understand it well enough. But I think some of our guys don't understand this, is that when you invest in kingdom... Now, when I say kingdom causes, I personally do not give to secular organizations or or organizations run by Christians that aren't Christian organizations. If they are not kingdom-oriented organizations, I just don't waste my money on them personally because I want to have a eternal investment in that organization. I want lives changed through my dollars. And so that when I think of an eternal or a treasure principle, that's what I'm thinking. In some ways, it's a little selfish, right? Because I'm making an investment that I'm going to get a dividend on in eternity. Let's call it scriptural, not selfish, okay? I know, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I'm motivated it. by what the Word of God, God is saying. God says, store Riches in heaven, or where you know, rust and moth will not destroy. You know, I mean, ultimately, all this stuff is going to burn. It's going to be gone, vaporized. But what we send ahead is not. It's going to be there. So it's interesting. We had a podcast last week with a guy named Rex Tignor on legacy, and he, he his his initial title of the the deal was it all, it all goes in the box. In other words, everything in your life when you die, it all goes in the box. Yeah, good point. But then. I said something, and I'm going to recant what I said in that podcast. I said, accept your relationships. But that's not really true. It's from our relationships and my eternal investments. Because I can give dollars to kingdom-oriented organizations and never know the people who are impacted. Mm -hmm. So it really isn't just relationships, right? It's my resources. It's stewardship. stewardship. Obviously, you have a some... A comfortable factor there with doing it. I mean, you've seen what the organization does. Absolutely. I mean, there's integrity to it. So yeah, it's. I mean, so so how do you? So speaking of organizations and integrity, what are some uh, strategic ways, or what are some tactics you use in choosing an organization? I know you said you go to a certain website, but are there certain things you're really looking for? Well, yeah, I, I, you know, I think Jesus talked a lot about children and the poor, so you can't go wrong with those two, right? And if yeah. you can get those two together, you got a double whammy. Poor children, <laughs> and, that, and that's you know that's the large large part of our our giving goes to that area. Are there any organizations that you would recommend to somebody that without playing out your hand there? Yeah, um, we really like an outfit called Compassion International. Um, we really like they have a leadership initiative program and from the millions of kids or whatever the number is that they sponsor uh, they take kind of the people that are more promising and put them through college and leadership training and uh, it's just amazing you know they they're literally are changing the world I mean they grow up and run countries and mm. you know they're just large organizations and it's just an amazing way to have impact wow well, and the compassion is a great organization yeah. west stafford yeah. ran that organization he's, he's for years good, good guy who's the president now jimmy jimmy, jimmy mulatto mulatto i was going to say migloretto but that's a different you're, guy. You're, you're close at any rate he's he's got the same heart just uh just an amazing guy yeah last i heard they were reaching he's a guy a... that he's a guy that should be sitting right here man well, maybe someday he should. we should go after I'll, 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 we've had wes on the show yeah I'll wes actually you. endorsed my book strong men dangerous times but uh, they give eighty four percent of their income. Last I heard, goes straight to kids. Sure, that's a huge percentage of income. 
Wow, that's really cool. So and, uh, you know, one one of the best things about them is that you know one of their goals is whatever they do, they use a local church. Yeah. So that there's boots on the ground, so to speak. Yeah, and Wes just is a tremendous. Oh. He's he's probably the. I've written actually. This is in some of the stuff I've written. He's probably the greatest man I've ever met. I mean, I. That sounds cheesy. No, I but don't I mean, so. he's a phenomenal human being. I just don't. It's hard to comprehend when you look at a guy like that. You go, man, God, wow, good job. I remember when I first met him, he was speaking at our church, and I remember thinking to myself, I wish my wife was married to a man like that. No, oh, he's a hero. Yeah, but I mean, we can be those. I mean, we're all. That's what God has made all of us to be. That hero to somebody. You know, and in our story, we have different anointings, but yeah, no, I, I, I think that's amazing. So Rick, so what are, what are groups that you tend to avoid when it comes to giving? I guess I would, I would mirror what you said. I mean, if eternity is not involved, it doesn't interest me. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, the poor, young, leading people to Christ. Um, helping people become uh, self-sufficient. There's another one, if I can name it, we really like. It's called Plant with a Purpose. And what they do is they they go out and they, they do a lot of reforestation, but at the same time, they teach people the, you know, the issues with not, you know, cutting everything down, you know, what their priorities are. At the same time, they help them become fruit farmers or one way or the other. But the idea is to get them self-sufficient and then to actually, part of the training is once they're self-sufficient, they'll help their neighbor get started. Mm. And so, you know, not only do they lead people to Christ, but they also lead people to living wages. So, you know, it's just a, it's a win-win. Wow. Mm. That's really cool. That's cool. So Rick, it's always fun to hang out, man. I, I, I know I drug you in here and made you do something formal, but normally we're just playing around and doing stuff. But w- what are some parting words you would offer? Give me some Rick Robinson wisdom to a guy who's raising kids or in his home. What are some parting words you want to say to that guy who's, who may be struggling a little bit with the giving thing right now? What are, what, what's some parting words of wisdom you want to give that guy? Well, this may be going a little bit outside the box, but... For a long time, I've always had a five-year plan, and I've always had the five-year plan written down. And uh, I just think it's important to have goals, and it's important to have them written down. And, you know, it sounds kind of hokey at first, but if you will do that, it is amazing what happens. I mean, things happen that are in no way should ever be able to happen, but I I believe your mind and God is working on those as you're looking at your goals and praying about them. There's just things going on at 30,000 feet that I haven't quite figured mm-hmm. out and things just tend to happen. And then I also think having a personal personal mission statement is really good. Um, just simple little phrases like leave better than when you got there. Mm-hmm. Just little things that you want your life to reflect. And you write them down and you start looking at them and it's amazing. Some of them just start happening. Yeah, it's really funny. So when I was 32 years old, I wrote a personal mission statement to glorify God with my spiritual shape, which is spiritual gifts, heart, abilities, personality experiences, right? Rick Warren stuff. To glorify God with my spiritual shape, loving or letting God mold me into his image. That's the number one priority. Loving my family with honor. Living every day to the fullest with courageous abandoning and leaving a legacy through writing, speaking, and change lives. And you know... 25 years later, that hasn't changed. It's been a compass because God writes, God puts that vision in our heart, right? And then it's really funny. You'll appreciate this. Uh, our, I have an executive coach, coach right now, and he actually was the executive coach for uh, Compassion International, West Stafford. Oh, wow. And so he's a big five year, three to five year plan guy. Sure. And I'm like, well, we do one year. And he goes, well, that's tactics, but that means you're weak on strategy. So now we're in the middle of building these three to five year plans which you'll appreciate. And he t- taught me a word. I don't know if you know this word. Have you heard of the word strategos? Do you know what that is? Above my pay grade there. So it's a Greek term. Strategos is basically what we now call a general. A strategos in ancient Greece would develop a plan to win the war. Okay. And then he would send out his lieutenants to win the battles and to, to, to implement the, the tactics of how to win the war. But the strategos. And so that's where we get the word strategy. And so strategy is that three to five year plan. So you've been telling me that for years 
and uh, and I'm finally like getting the 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 pen, the ink on the paper. <laughs> right on, man. Many can steer the sheet, sheet up, but few can chart, chart the course. Oh yeah, that sounds very John Maxwell to me. Yeah, it's that might, might be where I heard that. Law of navigation. Yeah, twenty one irrefutable laws of leadership. Yeah, anyway, five, right. Rick, man, it's been great to have you on the show. Sure, hey, appreciate thanks. coming in, buddy. So, All right. hey, I want to get our guys before you leave, Rick. I want to get our guys with their boots on the ground. So guys, what's the next step? What are you going to do today because of what you heard discussed? I know this is a different topic than what we normally hit you with, but generosity is critical for your eternal uh, uh, rewards for the for the uh, kingdom to, to push back the darkness on earth. And so I want to challenge you to take a step of faith in your stewardship journey, and I want you to begin tithing, which means tithing, giving 10%, trusting God with 10%, and giving it to kingdom causes that you care about. Trust God with that and see what God will do. Dale, what's up next, brother? Drive us home. Yeah, man, we want you to head on over to meninthearena.org and pick up your copy of Strong Men, Dangerous Times. Get into a group with other men and start living a full throttle life. Until next time, feel the wet sand on the arena floor, hear the deafening roar of the crowd, taste the sweetness of victory, smell the stench of battle, get in the game, get dirty, grind it out, and be a man. You've been listening to the Men in the Arena podcast. If you hunger to be your best version, then join thousands of men from around the world in our Men in the Arena forum on Facebook. This is the best place to have open discussions around the topic of biblical manhood. Make sure to explore our website at meninthearena.org, sign up for the weekly equipping blast, and take advantage of our many free resources designed to help you become your best version of a man. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Men in the Arena podcast. Remember, when a man gets it, Everyone wins.